Generation 3 of Pokemon is to this day regarded as one of the best installments in the Pokemon series. Yet despite that, even its most iconic title, Pokemon Emerald, does not hold up near as well as many people think. Today I'm going to be analyzing and judging the major aspects of Emerald, including Pokemon, gym leaders, evil teams, rivals, and the Elite Four. And after looking at everything individually, I'm then going to put the whole analysis together and explain my big three issues with Emerald. But an important question to ask before we even get into it is, why? Am I just some cranky old man yelling in the street looking for YouTube relevancy once more? Well, no, you see, I actually really love Pokemon Emerald. It's one of my favorite games of all time, and I actually love it so much that I am going to make a ROM hack of this game that fixes all the issues that we are about to outline today. It's going to be a big project, but if you want to follow along, I'm going to be giving away 10 physical copies of this game once it's done to subscribers, so just watch to the end if you want to know how to get in on that. Anyway, round three. Let's do this. Part one, an introduction to Hoenn. It's really important that we understand where Emerald sits in the Pokemon catalog if we're going to properly fix it. If anything can be said about Generation 3, it's that it feels like the series' first fully-fledged Pokemon game. If Gen 1 is Pokemon's alpha with low-quality graphics full of bugs, then Gen 2's Johto is Pokemon's beta, a refinement of the core ideas but unpolished and overall failing to nail the execution. I think it makes sense to say then that Ruby and Sapphire sit as the franchise's version 1.0. And that makes sense, right? If you think about what comes after these games, it's all very homogenous, but Gen 3 to 2 and even 1 has like a major lack of cohesion. This holds especially true from a graphics perspective, but it's not just that. Ruby and Sapphire are the first games to feature a truly new roster of Pokemon. They've got the friendly rival trope, brand new evil teams, a world's ending plotline, a region disconnected from the previous game, and so on. Ruby and Sapphire gave so much to Pokemon, and I think they greatly defined the core or formula of a Pokemon game. But of course, as the initial 1.0 version launch of Hoenn, these games were still unperfect. Many of the gym leader teams are tragically built, the evil storyline is unfulfilling, and there's hardly any post-game content. And so if Ruby and Sapphire are the game launch 1.0 version, then we could sort of look at Emerald as the game's first massive update. And unlike Pokemon and Crystal, which updated their generational launches quite minimally, Pokemon Emerald is the equivalent of a remastered nuke. Tiles and caves have been updated, there's optional double battles everywhere, the gym leaders have had incredible makeovers, I mean Jesus Christ, look at one's Kingdra. Speaking of which, there's actually a new gym leader and champion, there's uh, this guy, Scott, y'all remember Scott? The evil plot is now combined to make one cohesive story, and there's this incredible post-game thing called the Battle Frontier. Pokemon Emerald is basically Game Freak looking at everything they did in Ruby and Sapphire being like, dang, we screwed up a lot here, we can, we can do better and just fixing stuff. I mean, I guess that's kind of a lot of third titles, but Emerald really was the first to do it right. And so it does a good job, but they only had one year to really look back and fix stuff. But now with our 20 years to reflect on these games, we can look back and say, you know what? They kind of messed up in a few places. Because when I return to Emerald now, things just feel a little off. My experience like doesn't quite line up with my nostalgic memories. Glaringly large problems that my 12 your old brain was incapable of, of noticing at the time. And finishing these games as an adult leaves me frustrated and just screaming, too much water. Unfortunately though, when it comes to Hoenn, water is the name of the game. So ladies and gentlemen, buckle in and prepare to dive a little deeper. Now all great playthroughs need the support of a strong starter. As we're going to see, Mudkip is the best water starter to date. And you want a chair that is reliable as Mudkip. And that's where today's sponsor, the C7 Flexi Spot, comes in. Now Squirtle and Totodile were fine water starters, just like maybe your current chair is okay, but it's also possible that your chair just isn't doing it for you, causing back pain or sedentary discomfort. And in the same way that Mudkip is like the goat of starters, you're getting the same thing when you upgrade to a C7. Because in the same way that Mudkip supports your early game, this chair has a self-adaptive lumbar support cushion that automatically adjusts as you move. And just like how Mudkip can be optimized to your exact playstyles and preferences with TMs, the C7 can adjust in all directions to perfectly fit your height and weight. It also has a forward leaning position and the 20 inch seat even allows you to sit cross-legged. And even better than shiny Mudkip, it comes with 
a multitude of amazing colors. It's available in both mesh and foam options, and there is a 30-day free return, plus it comes with a 10-year warranty. It's of course suitable for anyone who spends long hours grinding the region of Hoenn, or, you know, actually doing work. And as an aside, they even sent me the chair to test out, but it didn't get here before I could record this video. And after sitting in for a bit, it genuinely is a very well-constructed chair. So if you're interested in up your game, you can get this by following the top link in the description and use code C730 for $30 off. Part two, the starters. As your first companion partner, starters are possibly the biggest defining feature of a new generation. And so I think if we're gonna start anywhere, we should start from the beginning where the game sees the series professor being attacked by a level two zigzagoon. Now, what I love about this scene is that it makes for a much more compelling starter selection than the previous games. Rather than making your choice in the safety of a lab, the game has you do it under pressure. And I really love this because it adds a bit of affirming weight to your decision. It's not just pick which one looks cool, but being forced to pick under pressure really affirms that decision and I don't know like maybe it makes your bond with your Pokemon stronger. Unfortunately though I'm not a nerd. I'm an experienced ass player and I know that there is only one right decision to make for your starter in Hoenn. And despite my love for the cute little guy, Mudkip is actually the very first problem with this game. And I should preface that it's not like starters have ever been balanced, but compared to the first two gens, Generation 3 flubs starter selection in a very different way. In Generation 1, Bulbasaur was clearly the easy early game pick, and this effectively acted as the game's easy mode. This was fine though, because eventually all three starters would grow into their own and become powerful. Now in Generation 2, all three starters were unequal again, but this was more so in a sense that one was bad and the other two were good. Generation 3 has a much different approach and I really think it hurts the game. The first thing that Hoenn does different is give their starters very useful secondary typing. Outside of Poison and Flying, which do absolutely nothing for Venusaur and Charizard, the starters had all felt very ingrained in their main type from the Elemental Trio. So, you know, adding a cool second type Seems like a pretty good idea. The adorable baby chick turns into a badass firefighting chicken. I, 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 it's still a chicken? The tadpole frog looking thing gets ground type and turns into a destroyer of worlds. Oh, and this derpy looking green guy? <laughs> oh, you fool. You utter moron. What are you, a 12 year old? You thought the grass starter was also going to get a cool second type? Oh no, 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 it's just... Grass. It's grass and nothing but grass for you, buddy. So at even the most basic glance, it's clear that the three starters are not given equal treatment. And this might lead you to believe that it's just another Jota situation where two are good and the grass is once again bad. That is, however, not the case. I think the most broken thing about Mudkip is that it only has one weakness in grass type. And that still could have worked given that there were certain checks and balances added to the game. You know, like, grass types. In the entire game, there are four Pokemon on major teams that can hit Swampert for super effective damage. Furthermore though, Swampert matches up really well against the gym leaders, evil teams, and elite four. It can basically hit every major trainer, but like gym two and eight for super effective damage. And a lot of that is Stab, Surf, and Earthquake. Like it's not just the best starter, it's the best Pokemon in the game, period. Swampert is so seriously good that it hurts the starter selection because when you don't go with Swampert, you have this sense of foregoing, you know, the best Pokemon in the game. And I suppose that, you know, like if the other two starters were still quite strong, that might still work. But this is also sadly not true. After Torchic gets fighting for the first rock gym, it really just can't do much more. It's kind of gets its ass kicked in the Brawly fight, then it gets its ass handed to it in the Watson fight, and then despite having a resistance to fire, is out here getting one tapped by Flannery. Oh, and then despite having type advantage over Norman, gets absolutely dusted. And this is the better half of its gym performances. Because after that, you've got Winona flying, then Psychic, and then Water. Now, sure, Blaziken does come back pretty hard for the Elite Four. I mean, at least until Pokemon Emerald adds a Water Champion. And it also, to be fair, has a very solid performance against the evil teams. So it's bad, but yet somehow, someway, Trico is arguably worse. Trico matches up genuinely great to Roxanne and Tate and Liza, but that's kind of it. Like, there are two major trainers that specialize in water, and it's bad against both of them. The only thing that's menacing on Wan's team is a Kingdra, which knows Ice Beam and destroys Sceptile, and then Sceptile has one good matchup 
in the champion fight. Even worse is up until level 29, you're hitting everything with absorb. I mean, its best move is 70 power versus Swampert's 95 and 100 or Blaziken's 90 and 100. And let me say it again, you also don't get a second type. So hopefully I have made a compelling case as to why these starters are unbalanced. But is that an actual problem, you might ask? Do they need to be balanced? Honestly, no, they don't. The real problem is in how wide the gap is. If Bulbasaur, Squirtle, and Charmander acted as an easy, medium, hard mode, Mudkip in Emerald is basically Super Weenie Hut Jr., with the other two starters then being hard mode. And while the starters are very weirdly balanced, this is far from the only set of Pokemon that see this. Part 3. Team building and Pokemon balance. Your options for team building are another feature of Gen 3 that is integral to its design. There is basically one small group of Pokemon that works really good for playing these games. This is the group of Pokemon like you know exactly which ones I'm talking about. When we think about how we used to play Emerald, we think of that team, right? And we think, yeah, that was great. But if you ever have played Emerald with not those 10 Pokemon, it's a very different experience. The options fall off quite drastically, and there's not really a rhyme or reason as to why some Pokemon are good and some are bad. To give you a really simple example, let's take a look at the Gen 3 bird Pokemon, Talo and Swablu. Talo is available at the start of the game, evolves at level 22, and gets its first strong flying move wing attack at just level 13. For context, that is so far above and beyond what we saw in the previous games. And it does show the series finally starting to evolve towards accepting good moves as a standard. The problem in Emerald is that this treatment has not yet become uniform. Comparatively, Swablu is caught all the way after the third gym, evolves at level 35, and is stuck with the move Peck forever. 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 Or, you know, at least until the fifth gym when you get fly. But let's take another example with Curlia. It's got low stats, but it does at least get a crazy early psychic at level 26. Comparatively, Grumpig and Alakazam get it in the late 30s. Now, things may not be perfectly equal here, but given Curlia's relative trade off with bad stats, it does actually make sense. But how about uh, Soul Rock? Never learns it. Meditate? Never learns it. Surely. After three generations, star you never learns it. And guys, I could and will go on and on. Nuzleaf, that's right, Nuzleaf never learns a single grass move. Dusclops never learns Shadow Ball. Mawile, where are your steel moves? Manectric, no Thunderbolt. Ninjask, have you forgot about your bug and flying moves? Like, it's one thing for us to clown on Gen 1 learn sets because those were the first games. But we are in the third generation. What is going on? And you know, just as a thought experiment, I want to next look at what Pokemon are actually good in this game. To start with the water type, which makes up the majority of this list, you've got Swampert, Swampert at home, Gyarados, Tentacruel, Waylord, Milotic, Starmie, Lantern, Kingdra, and Walrein. That's good, except for the fact that everything after Swampert is invalidated by Swampert, but maybe Walrein. Outside of the water category, things then get really bleak. You've got Guts Facade Swellow, Gardevoir, Breloom, Hariyama, Agron, Skarmory, Manectric, Flygon, Magneton, and Salamence for the very end of the game. Was that your list, by the way? Like, that, that had to be at least half of the Pokemon that you always ran as a kid in Emerald. Anyway, that's like kind of it for the genuinely good Pokemon. Like there are some other semi-decent picks in certain scenarios like Crobat, Claydol, Torkoal, Tropius, but the point is that most of Gen 3's good Pokemon are water type, and those ones are only good due to having decent stats plus access to Surf and probably Ice Beam. And then outside of that, there's just like not a lot of options. So, you know, clearly we're getting to the point where type distribution is starting to become an obvious problem. And when you actually break it down, it's like really funny. Okay, so not counting legendaries or post-game catches, just the actual usable Pokemon. Water type has 22 total unique families. The second most abundant type in the game is Flying and Psychic with 13, then it's Normal with 12, followed by Rock at 11, and Grass at 10. Bug, Poison, and Ground all have nine families, while Dark has a respectable seven families all introduced in Generation 3. So that's, you know, Fine. This then takes us down to the very, very sad tier. Fighting sees just six families in Blaziken, Breloom, Hariyama, Medicham, Machamp, and 
Heracross. Yeah, it was a bit of a shock to me too, but Heracross is in this game. But Electric sees an even sadder roster of six, with Electrode, Pikachu, and Magneton making up half the list. Lantern is the Johto rep. And then I refuse to count Puzzle and Minum as two unique Pokemon. They're so bad, I actually might argue they don't count as Pokemon at all. This is a shiny blue Pichu and a shiny red Pichu. But uh, yeah, basically only new Hoenn Electric type is Manectric. The fire is in an even worse spot with five. You've got Blaziken, Torkoal, Camera, Ninetales, and Mecargo. Ghost sees just four in Shedinja's Sableye, Binette, and Dusclops. Dragon sees four as well, but with you know, three new dragon types. I think that's actually amazing. Still with four and only three new types is a little more disappointing, however. Worse than that though, there is a type in Pokemon Emerald that only has three members belonging to it. One of which is a legendary, which, which effectively takes this number down to two. It is the ice type, held down by nothing but Glalie and Walrein. And so on top of poor move balance, poorly statted Pokemon, the third and final issue of team building and Pokemon balance is just in the actual distribution itself. These three things sort of come together and it makes Emerald like this just purely uniform experience where every single kid remembers having a Thunderbolt Gardevoir. The problem being is that if you ever try to use a Pokemon that you actually just like and it's not one of the good 10, um, you just have a very bad time. And even worse is all these issues kind of come together to make another big problem in the game, which is the actual opponent teams. Part Four, gym leaders. Roxanne is the game's first gym leader, who some may say specializes in rock type. However, it's hard to tell as this may in fact just be the Geodude gym. Rustboro features eight Pokemon, and of which seven are Geodude. Now overall, Emerald did do a really good job of revamping Ruby Sapphire's gym leader teams. With Roxanne though, they just gave her another Geodude. And so as far as building an interesting roster goes, Roxanne's a bit of a problem. And guys, it's important to remember here, it's not Geodude's fault, but actually Game Freaks. Many Rock-type members of Hoenn just simply aren't suited for the first gym. Relicanth, Corsola, Mecargo, Lunatone, and Solrock are all single-stage Rock-types that have way too high stats. There are, however, still some better options than Geodude. There's Rock Steel Aeron, who is still weak to water and fighting. There's Rhyhorn, which hardly has better stats than Geodude and never appears in the game. And you've also got the two fossils, Lyleep and and Anerith, who's by the way, bug type, grass type, second type, like, that would have been so cool, you know, cause then you couldn't just spam a water or a grass move. Crazy, but no, they just Geodude. Now I will say that Nosepass is certainly a step up from Gen 1's Onyx. And I do think it provides a genuine challenge. So for the first gym, this is certainly not a nothing fight. It is somewhat engaging. And despite my criticism, I still think it's good enough because it's the first gym to go into the B tier. Now the second gym leader Brawly has a team consisting of Machop, Metatite, and Makuhita, which are the game's only two new first stage fighting types. With two of the four available fighting types being final stage evolutions, we see ourselves in another weird kind of Roxanne situation, right? Imagine this as like a gym six fight with a Breloom, Heracross, would have been a lot cooler. Now, despite this though, I am still pretty satisfied with what Brawly brings. Bulk Up is his main strategy, and it's the first instance of many Emerald trainers with stat boosting moves, which means that this is the first time the player faces a serious threat of wiping. Now, it's unfortunate that the meta type does absolutely nothing because it just spams focus punch, but I think Makuhita is enough to still bring the heat and make this a relatively interesting fight. The biggest issues with Brawly is actually the junior trainers, parties, and lack of XP. The only thing in this gym are the three Pokemon on his team, and if you fight everyone, which you definitely need to, there is very little XP still between him and Roxanne. Overall, Brawly manages to be a strong yet fair gym leader though, so I would put him in the A tier. Now, Watson sees a big upgrade from his original Surge 2.0 team, but this comes with other problems. Now, I've just decided to throw a random tier list into this video. You know, it's a ranking every gym leader video too, a little extra value. But I should just preface, like this tier list, this, this ranking, you know, it's, it's all about like, what fight is fun? To me, fun is just a thing of like, is it engaging enough that I have to really think in thinking, am I rewarded for my decisions? Difficulty is very important in the fun components, but there's fair difficulty and unfair difficulty. And as soon as something starts to feel unfair, it becomes very unfun. Watson is an example of a gym leader that is 
Difficult, but not fun. First, the Volt Orb has self-destruct, like six levels before it actually learns it. And with such high speed, it's just very likely to wreck one of your Pokemon. Now the first Manectric is totally fine, but the next absurd thing is Magneton. It's incredibly underleveled for its Evo, and it isn't even the gym's ace. Now I get that Manectric should be evolved. This is the third gym. We probably want a final stage evolution, but why do you give that to Magneton as well? Manectric is very strong. And if you don't have a ground or grass type, the only Pokemon which can take more than two hits from its shockwave is a level 24 Hariyama. And that just sort of makes us beg the question, why is this team so strong? Well, this team is probably so strong because of Mudkip. Even with so many strong Pokemon, Marshtomp can just sweep. With Marshtomp, or Geodude for that matter, this gym is really easy. The problem is that with Odeground type, it is absurdly hard, and there's nothing in the area that you can catch to make it easier. Instead, you have to go all the way back to Dufort Cave and pick up a level 8 Geodude. To me, this all works together to create what is a very bad gym leader experience. Under a very specific set of circumstances, it is incredibly easy, unfortunately though not rewarding in its ease, and outside of that, it's just unfairly balanced for the point that you are in the game. So for all these reasons, I would actually put Watson in the D tier. Fortunately, Emerald manages to come back with Flannery, showing some of the best fights in the game. Flannery features a really cool sun weather team. What's so great about it is it's before the game's water options really open up. Her team feels genuinely diverse and she uses a unique strategy which can be overcome in many different ways. Marsh Stomp, Azumarill, Pelipper, and Tentacruel are all solid water options, but there is, again, not an overabundance and more importantly, no surf. There's also other non-water options to help like Torkoal, Numel, and Geodude. And you have been given a Rock Tomb TM, so it's not like you have absolutely no answers against her. It's similarly difficult to Watson, but the thing is, is that it provides many more ways to win. The sun plus Flannery's white herb Torkoal makes her very threatening, but there are many readily available options of how to play around it. It's a very rewarding gym, and so she's the first of four trainers that I would place in the S tier. And following her up is Norman, who is once again an incredibly hard challenge that has many ways to beat him. First of all, I love the team. The inclusion of both family members Slacking and Vigoroth actually actually makes sense here, as they feel like genuinely different Pokemon. Linu is terrifying with Belly Drum, and even Linda the Spinda somehow manages to feel at home here. Now, with 670 base stats, Slacking is obviously the terrifying member of the group, but the key thing is that its truant ability makes it a very unique challenge. Brute forcing your way through this fight is very tough, so you need to think outside the box. There's a strategy that involves having a Pokemon use Protect on Slacking's turn, and then they attack on Slacking's truant turn. You can also pull off a similar strategy with the desert Pokemon that knows Dick. There's even crazier stuff like using Golbat to land Confuse Ray, then Double Team and finally Bite Flinching to just destroy his chances of hitting you. Sure, you could say Norman isn't that interesting because you can just cheese him with Protect. The difference in Norman and Watson is that the way to beat Watson is just to pick the good starter. That is really simple. That doesn't take any thought whatsoever. But let's be honest, how many of us were smart enough at 12 to think of using Protect strats? That's really the key difference in why Norman works so well and Watson doesn't. Norman is another just banging fight, I gotta send him to the S tier. The sixth gym leader Winona is unfortunately a step back, however. To start, her Swamp Loot lead gives players free reign to set up, and it's especially frustrating when you realize it was swapped from Swellow in Ruby and Sapphire. Even worse, Tropius shares a four times ice weakness with Altaria, and its sunny day works against her water Pelipper, which is of course the next Pokemon out. Pelipper also just kinda sucks with water gun and protect with no stall strats. Skarmory is a solid member of the team, Team, but it's really Altaria that carries here. Dragonance Altaria is a threat, but it's just not enough for this point in the game. The last two gyms have featured these really cool fights that are more than just a mono-type challenge. They bring a seriously unique addition to the fight, and all Winona has is a Pokemon that can set up and sweep you, which, you know, is like Gym 2 energy. I feel like what this gym really needs is like Tailwind or something, but especially coming off those last two fights, you know, the bar has been set. Winona, you don't reach the bar. To the C tier you go. From here though, we've got Tate and Liza, and oh boy, do things pick up. So, first major double battle of the game, and Game Freak is just like, gloves off, we're going as competitive as we possibly can. Is it a little bit too much? There's a case to be made for it, but if you're kind of tracking the difficulty curve from like Brawly to Flannery to Norman, this is kind of the next logical step. This fight goes 
so hard. I have been wrecked by Tate and Liza so many times, but it's good. It, it's fun. Like I have so many options to deal with these people and it's, it, I'm losing because I'm bad, not because it's unfair. Okay, guys, you gotta let me gush for just like 30 seconds. Right, we start the fight. It's a Claydol Zatu lead. Flying type Zatu goes for the Combine setup while Claydol sends off an earthquake that only affects your side. This just sets the stage so well, it's instantly tense where you're like, gotta make a decision of which one I'm gonna kill. You know, am I gonna let Zatu just set up and absolutely destroy me? Because if I don't want that to happen, I'm gonna have to keep taking earthquakes to the face. And you know, whichever one you choose to take out is still scary because it's either Lunatone next or Soul Rock. Lunatone runs light screen, calm mind, and hypnosis. So while it is walled by a dark type, it can still really help out this team. Soul Rock, on the other hand, can set Sun to nerf water. By the way, spamming Surf is probably one of your best options for this fight. It's just such a well crafted fight. It makes me question why all Emerald fights couldn't be this fun. Probably obvious, but once again, it's another S tier. Juan is a little different though. So in Pokemon Emerald, Wallace, the eighth gym leader of Ruby and Sapphire, moves to champion and his mentor Juan, who is also a water specialist, fills the slot. Now, before we even get looking to the team, this is just a huge problem. You've got the third elite four member Glacio with three water members. You've now got a water champion. Considering also that Team Aqua is in this section of the game, and now you've got a water eighth gym leader, water is just bloated. And I'm, I'm, I'm a little sponge and I'm just waterlogged. I, I can't take any more water than this. And it I, honestly, one, <laughs> okay, this is stupid. Let's just get into it. I think my least favorite thing outside of one's water bloat is that he doesn't even have a unique or compelling team. Like how can you make an argument that this is anything but a collection of five randomly chosen Pokemon? Like I think people want to say that this is a, a contest based team. Here's the thing one. Um, this is a, a Pokemon battle. Okay, so one has a love disc to set, which is hilarious, but this is his one unique Pokemon. Whiskash is seen on Wallace's team, Crondat is on Sydney's, there's two Celios on Glacia's, and Drake has a Kingdra. There was just no way that one could have worked. Because you have a water champion, you, you simply can't make the water eighth gym leader compelling. He's not gonna get the Pokemon that you wanna give him, and he has to be noticeably worse. Otherwise, he would outshine the champion. Yet despite this, I still have a whole other paragraph of issues with Juan. Let's talk about the Kingdra in the room. With only a dragon weakness, double team and rest, Juan's Kingdra is really hard to kill. Especially with that Chesto Berry to instantly wake up on the first rest, this is a cooked oat. Inks, if that was it, I would genuinely say, fine, at least he's got one good Pokemon. The problem though is not Kingdra double teaming twice and then healing up with rest. See, one has two hyper potions and it's the instances where you have to then whittle Kingdra's health down three more times while it has a 25% chance to be hit after six double teams. Remember I was saying like, I wanna have fun in Pokemon? Not fun, not a good time. Unfortunately, this little mishmash of stuff going on kind of results in it being my least favorite fight in the entire game. I hate Wand so much that I will go out of my way to just pick up a random Gyarados from a Super Rod, spam Dragon Dance six times on the Love Disc and just, just sweep because otherwise, I'm just gonna have a bad time. And it's not even like it's the major water trainer. So it's like, I'm not even missing out on a good time. It's just, it's so stupid. <laughs> Look, here's the key points. Emerald's gym as a whole are a very mixed bag. They're at their best when their monotype strategy is accentuated with a second unique defining experience. You know, a fire team in the sun, a competitive psychic double battle, or simply just a grossly strong normal Pokemon that can only attack every second turn. Emerald's gyms are at its worst when it's featuring bland, uncohesive teams or providing the player with just an unfair and frustrating challenge. The gyms attempt to set a precedent of extremely powerful teams with really the first instance of genuinely competitive movesets. Unfortunately, not every fight can live up to that standard, and there are even worse situations than with the gym leaders. Part 5. Team Aqua and Team Magma. Despite my criticism, the Emerald Gym League at least manages to almost always be 
interesting. This cannot be said for Team Aqua or Magma. We first fight an Aqua Grunt in Petalburg Woods, and it's a nice introduction. We then see Aqua again in Slateport, and it's nothing crazy, but, you know, still the early game. From there, it's Mount Chimney, where we're introduced to Team Magma, and we get an admin and maxi fight here, which is the first inklings of anything serious. Next, it's the Weather Institute with admin Shelly and just two Pokemon. And see, if I look at the challenge that these sets of teams provide, and, you know, compared to, say, Ruby and Sapphire Gen 2 or Gen 1, it's an improvement, but compared to the challenge that gym leaders are providing at this point, these fights are nothing. And it's the next four and final segments, because I, I think there's four, they're forgettable, but anyway, it's the last stretch of the team arcs that are garbage. Because through the corridors and walkways of the Space Center, Aqua Hideout, Magma Hideout, and finally Seafloor Cavern, the grunts are garbage. It's like every corner, you're running into Zubats and Poochienas 15 levels past their evolution. And it's really interesting because this kind of relates back to type distribution. As we stated before, there's only five fire families in the game. Now, Blaziken is a starter, so that can't be featured. Torkoal is a gym leader ace, so that's out too. But for some reason, Mercargo and Ninetales just don't want to appear. As for more ground-focused Pokemon, it's really just ball toy. And outside of that, the only other Pokemon featured in any Magma fight whatsoever is from the Zubat and Poochyena line. And if you're expecting Team Aqua to be any better, it's actually worse. Despite the 22 water families in this game, the only Pokemon families which appear on Aqua teams are Poochyena, Zubat, Carvana, and one single Whalmer on a random Grunt. And again, that is, that is every Grunt, every Admin, and Archie. Three Pokemon for the whole team. And basically, five Pokemon for both groups together. Like, I guess on top of just some bad type distribution, it was about them not wanting to make some Pokemon appear evil. But it's like, dude, Aqua could easily have run, I don't know, Gyarados, Golduck, Tentacruel, maybe Crawdont. Same can be said for Magma. Where is Geodude, Sandshrew, Trapinch, Claydol, Rhydon, Domphan, Macargo? There's so many stylistically appropriate choices here, but instead the evil team sections of the game do nothing but destroy Emerald's pacing. The grunt are utterly useless, and the major fights just don't have the weight to really make the segment rewarding. Like, both Maxi and Archie's teams only have three Pokemon, and it's of course Crobat and Mightyena, and then either Sharpedo or Camerupt. They have the best music in the game, and couldn't even make good teams in the third title. Just, just, just send them to the up tier. Part 6. The Rival. Arguably the only part of this game that feels more half-baked than the evil teams are the game's rivals Brendan or May. Now, outside of being helpful and actually kind, the game's rivals fill a very similar role in the early game. They follow the classic pick which strider is strong against your trope and provide some early game fights. It's as the game goes on that the rival starts to get a little different. Like, check out this team. It's what from about halfway through the game. Does anything look weird to you? Well, this was actually a little trick because the team you're seeing on screen is actually the rival's final fight. This team is fought after getting six badges and is the climactic finale to your rival. Four Pokemon and uh, an unevolved starter as an optional battle in Lily Cove. Now, I know what you're going to say. The rival's character arc is supposed to show them growing out of battling and getting more interested in completing their Pokedex. And it, it, it's true, after this fight, they basically say they're not really interested in battling and they're gonna head back home. Personally, I think this is an admirable and appropriate direction to take with this rival, but despite that, I do think it still leaves a lot to be desired. Not even getting to see the final stage evolution is very sad, and it's not the only case where their team is badly designed. Did you know that there's actually an error, like a genuine mistake on one of these teams? If May is your rival and you went with Torchic, she has a Torkoal in the Rustboro fight. For this point in the game, Torkoal is incredibly strong, but the fight after this and forever on, she's got Slugma and Torkoal never appears again. That is a genuine error. Look, people love to clown on Gen 2, but one thing you could say is there's at least no cases of like a genuine team error. And you know, one that probably caused a lot of players to wipe back in the day. So overall, the main rival is pretty uninteresting, but I can understand that this isn't totally without reason. And that's because the game is trying to set up another character to then become your true rival. Wally starts the game as a brand new Pokemon trainer, not much different from the player. He mirrors us and has an arc which ultimately places him as the big main challenge before the 
the league. It's trying to be a very compelling story. He picks up a Ralts and is then seen struggling as a beginner trainer when we battle him outside the Marvel gym. He then evolves his Ralts into Gardevoir, picks up an Altaria, Delcati, Roselia, and Magneton, beats all the gyms and goes on to reach Evergrande City and challenges for a second gym in Gallagher Victory Road. Sorry, did you, did you miss that? Cause yeah, me too. So look, it's clear what they were going for, but it all happens a little sudden. The very start of the game introduces our classic rival, but this time there is a slight twist of them not being a jerk bag. The rival does fight you, but it's clear that they're not as gung-ho as battling as the last two. They have other interests, they move on from battling, and this kind of goes to support the whole idea that it's not always about training if you don't want to, and that you can go catch the Pokemon and it's all good. But see, it's not instantly obvious that this is where it's going, and so it, there is a fake out here. This is the third rival we've seen, so you know, they go for something different. Brendan or May are not your rival, but instead it's that random trainer that you thought was just part of the catching tutorial. And while not becoming champion level twist cool, I honestly think that this is a great idea. The problem is just that it's not handled very well. The rival doesn't have any grand exit, and in my experience it just kind of felt like they fade and are then forgotten. Wally then showing up as the final rival fight in Victory Road could have still made for a good replacement, but the moment lacks oomph for two reasons. The first is that Wally's team just isn't that good. Roselia and Delcaddy are kind of tragic, and Altaria and Magneton get wrecked by 4x weaknesses. Considering how hard some of the gyms are, and that Wally actually caps lower than one, the fight does fall pretty flat. But more importantly, I just don't think Wally appears enough for him to really be cemented as a main character in the story. He's seen twice, and only fought once before the big final showdown. I remember playing Sapphire for the first time as a kid, and not even knowing who this Victory Road challenger was. And so while I respect what they were going for, the rival Faco just doesn't have the oomph I want it to. The one thing I will say for those, you know, eagerly awaiting Emerald Legacy is a lot of potential here. Anyway, as far as Emerald goes, we're gonna throw Wally into the B tier and uh, May's gonna go in C. Part seven the Elite Four. The first two generations of Pokemon struggled to deliver a challenging Elite Four, and Emerald Show's Game Freak's continued struggle with this element of design. Like, outside of just not being very hard, Sydney is a bit of a nothing burger. Two grass dark types are pretty boring, while the redundant appearance of Mightyena is really enough to make me throw up at this point. Absol can be scary with Swords Dance, but its lack of stab move and dark type being special just makes it a pretty sad ace. For the first member, it's fine. You know, that is, if you compare it to any other game but the one it's in, it's like Gym Leaders, Watson, Flannery, Tate and Liza, Norman, really hard. This is kind of like going back to like Ruby, Sapphire, Crystal, sort of just like stupid, easy, oh, it's a monotype, dark type team. Now, Phoebe is next, and while her team is built better, it's also much more boring. Phoebe sadly just has two Bonettes, two Dusclops, and a Sableye. And while this team mostly suffers from repeat fatigue, it at least does have solid coverage, but that's really it. It's like if you know there are only four ghost types in the game and you're just, you know, against using Shedinja, why make a Ghost E4 member? We saw that with Agatha in Gen 1. It wasn't good. You know, maybe you could order the major bosses of the game in a way such that they actually have enough Pokemon to construct a, a full team. Just saying, no grass type specialist, a lot of grass types. And what's crazy is this problem only gets worse with Glacia. What, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart, is Game Freak's obsession with putting ice types as a late game enemy. Ice type is bad. As an opponent, it is very easy to fight very, very many weaknesses. And yet for some reason, like, Every single Pokemon game has Ice as a late game boss. The trend may not have started here, but it is certainly at its worst here. Glacia has just two family members. Two of which are unevolved, and three of which that are water types. Also, she runs Hail Strats in a game where Hail does nothing but cause chip damage to any Pokemon that is not Ice type. Fourth gym, third Elite Four member. I almost sometimes feel like these first three E4 members are worse than the evil teams because I have such high expectations. The E4 is just an extension of the gym league. It's so disappointing to see them bring such awesomeness to the gyms, and then these first three E4 members are just complete boring. Anyway, it is eventually redeemed in the fourth Elite Four fight with Drake. Part of which I think is because the first two generations have three Dragon Master fights that feature very, very bad teams. So Drake with four unique Pokemon, three of which being actual new generational additions, like it just feels 
so good. Like, sure, he's got three, four times ice weaknesses, but this is kind of the name of the game with dragon types. Kingdra, fortunately, does a lot for him here. And could Shalgon be better? Yes. But at least pure dragon provides something unique that isn't getting one shot by ice. Drake is a really solid trainer, and he deserves A tier. But what about Wallace? Well, honestly, um, I really like him. Wallace's team has iconic members, good moves, and best of all, strong secondary typing. You can't sleep with Grass because of Gyarados, Tentacruel, and Ludicolo. Can't sleep with an Electric because of Ludicolo and Whizcash. And then the two pure water types on each end are better because of that. In fact, this is such a well-built water team that I'm not sure I would change anything. Wallace's champion team is easily the best constructed team in the series to date. So it's then really sad that there is such a glaring issue here. I ran a poll on this channel and 94% of the 30,000 of you that voted said that in your mind, Steven Stone is the true champion of Hoenn. Meaning that despite Emerald being the popular game, it's Ruby and Sapphire's champion that people associate Hoenn with. And it's crazy because Steven is way worse. And I only mean that as far as his team goes, because as a character, this is what you guys voted for. See, Game Freak kind of backed themselves into a corner. Ruby and Sapphire create a narrative around Steven being the champion, and they didn't do a good job of adjusting for that in Emerald. In Emerald, it's Steven who you see throughout the entire game, and Wallace's only contribution is needing to ask a 12-year-old where the Sky Pillar is. Steven retains that there for every step of the way vibe. He's a little mysterious, he's helping you out along the way. He even does a double battle fight with you. And so when it's then Wallace that is waiting in the champion room, there's a very big lack of payoff. Steven is helpful, whereas Wallace does nothing in the story. And so this just creates a feeling of resentment. I mean, like 94% is, is pretty compelling. I think I can say like we as, as a fan base just don't like Wallace. Steven was the guy and yet what are you doing here? Just go away. So from a fight perspective, I, I am going to give Wallace S tier. Like it is a great fight, but storyline is a really important thing, especially for the champion. And I don't know, it's just like when you place in a champion that people dislike more than the evil team leaders, you have seriously messed up in your storytelling. I don't know. It's a, a very big issue that we need to think about moving into Emerald Legacy. As it currently is, it's a mess. How do you fix that mess? There's really no way to do it without drastically changing something. <laughs> Leaving it alone though, may arguably be worse. Anyway, more to come on that, so you should probably subscribe. But with all the cards on the table now, it's time to finally look at the big three. Part eight. The big three. The first driving force that holds Emerald back is inconsistency. I can play this game with a Swampert, Gardevoir, Salamence, Agron, Manetric, Swellow build, and it feels like a good game. But if you venture much off that standard team, Emerald suddenly starts to feel very scary. Furthermore, we went very in depth in this video looking at major trainers, but there's an entire roster untalked about of average, normal run of the mill trainers that are really bad. Here's a challenge for you. Name me a single normal trainer in the game that is difficult. Personally, I can name one fight. It's that skill swap slacking double battle at the very end of Victory Road. Outside of Victory Road though, I, I don't think there is like genuinely a single hard normal trainer. So, you know, we sit here and we talk about, oh, this gym is good and this gym is not so good. But regardless of, of which gym is good, everything in between is dead easy. It's also inconsistent in its story. Like Wallace kind of comes out of nowhere. Wally isn't in the picture at all until the last beats of the game. The villains look like absolute idiots. Brendan or May just kind of disappear. Emerald's story is a little all over the place. There's even more than that. It's inconsistent in its move distribution. Inconsistently powered abilities, which I, I couldn't even touch on because it, it's absurd. Inconsistent distribution of types, even inconsistent encounters. And and so when I talk about inconsistency, what I mean are those little tiny micro details of game design. It's those little pieces of moves and encounters and, 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 and typing, individual lines of dialogue even. And these sort of come together to create the mid-sized 
building blocks of the game. You know, these come together to make things like full storylines or, or gym leader teams or your own teams. And so what I would say is that these slightly larger building blocks take us to the second issue, which is an issue of being uncommitted. Like from a gameplay perspective, what is Pokemon Emerald? It is kind of trying to be a challenge mode. There's really strong gym leaders, but at the same time, everything in between is, is just is bad. Is this trying to be a new story? Well, okay, yes, it arguably does a lot of things better, but like if you're trying to make a new story and make Wallace champion, why did you keep all of those beats of Steven throughout the game? Enemy and player teams are boring. Trainers are way too under leveled, most Pokemon are too bad to seriously use, even things I love, like the Tate and Liza fight. It's not like there's much warning to prepare you for a competitively strategized double battle. Don't get me wrong, I love that there are double battles in this game. The problem is that there's not enough for you to seriously build your team around that system. It makes for really fun fights and it doesn't bother me, but there is genuine reason to complain about that. Is it a singles mode? Is it a doubles mode? It's mostly a singles mode, but like sometimes you just get thrown doubles and you can't really prepare for it. It's an inconsistent philosophy in those little micro details that leads to an uncommitted vision in each larger block or component of the game. And it's these building blocks that form together to create my final and biggest of the three issues with Pokemon Emerald. Inconsistency in foundational decisions leads to an uncommitted vision. This builds a house of unfulfillment. Okay, it's unfulfillment. Emerald is unfulfilling. Despite being the best in the series to date, despite creating such a colorful, diverse world, despite doing so much right, is just unfulfilling. It's a game of half-baked concepts that we look back on with rose-tinted glasses and only recall its many highs. We often forget the lows of two of the three starters being bad, or the evil teams posing no threat, or every casual trainer in the game being a bag of dicks. We forget all these little tiny issues that build together to just create a very flawed game. Playing Pokemon Emerald today just leaves me with a sense of dissatisfaction. It sucks because I have such a huge spot in my heart for the Gen 3 games, but they just don't hold up like my brain thinks they do. It absolutely had the most highs in the series to date, but there's still so much lacking that I just can't sit here and act like these games are perfect. But what I can do is fix the things that I don't like. I want a Pokemon Emerald that my nostalgia remembers. And so so that is exactly what we are going to make. Pokemon Emerald Legacy is going to be a ROM hack that fixes the many issues we have just addressed. As I've said with the previous hacks I've made, Yellow and Crystal Legacy, the goal with this ROM hack will be to fix the underlying issues of the game while trying our best to make it still feel like Emerald. Emerald poses some very specific issues, so perhaps in a way the goal will be to make it feel like a amalgamation of the three Hoenn games. The point is, a Pokemon Emerald that is as good as your nostalgia remembers. Also, can you think of like any other difficult side trainers? Like I swear, it's literally that skill swap slacking. That, that is it. If you can think of anything, let me know. Anyway, this will be made into a patch for everyone to play. 18 million people are going to ask that, so maybe if you see a comment, you can go ahead and, and let them know. If you are interested in possibly getting a physical copy, we just ask that you subscribe to the channel. And the second component is just please comment your thoughts on, on how we can make the version of Emerald we're trying to to make. Just just one idea, one aspect, that's all we need. We don't need, you know, paragraphs and paragraphs, but just really curious to, to get a, a sense from the community of, of what you guys think we should do. Anyway, we are going to build the perfect version of Pokemon Emerald. If you'd like to follow along on the journey, please just subscribe and I will see you real soon. Peace.